The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work, and how we can all do both better. Today, we're bringing you part two of my conversation with Dean Yates. A quick recap. Dean was a longtime journalist and reporter who was present for events like the 2002 Bali bombings and the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004. Until he faced one more major traumatic event and an aftermath that led to him leaving the company and job he had worked in for decades. We'll dive back in now to hear the rest of his story and how it relates to larger structures about society and work. did a lot of work. You went to psychiatric hospital. What was really interesting to me was the way that you so quickly became a journalist again, and you frantically wanted to learn everything about this, tell your story, tell other people's stories, crusade for veterans and other people mm who had seen war and experienced this, and that that was maybe not healthy for you. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the most remarkable things to me was when you, you you published a big story, and I want you to talk a little bit about this, and you got all these Facebook messages and emails and all this approbation, you know, saying, oh, my God, this is me. Thank you. It seemed to me that that was almost re-injuring for you and really overwhelming. Yeah, no, look, I, I learned a lot from that whole experience. So this is back in 2016. And on my first psych ward admission, in fact, I was at a conference today and I was talking about this exactly where on my second day, my psychiatrist had recommended that I read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. So I, I read this book and it just gave me such hope. It gave me, it, it sort of helped me understand that wow, here's this guy. He was a psychiatrist. He gets transported into these concentration camps by the Nazis. He spends three years there, and yet he's, he's able to find meaning in life out of this struggle and these horrible conditions that he has to live in. And I found that book so inspiring and so profound that I thought, I've been to Helen back, but maybe I can find meaning in my life again by mm -hmm. sharing my story, telling my story. And at the same time, I can tell the story of the people who I'm in this psych ward with who are veterans and coppers who don't have the sort of journalistic background that I've got. And I was just off. I was like, okay, I've got a story to report now. And that story is PTSD. And so I just got this burst of motivation and an inspiration. And it actually worried my treating team because they just said, they said, you're going too fast on this. You've got to really slow down. You're going to fall over. And in fact, at one stage in my first psych ward admission, they wanted me to sign a contract, an actual document which would state that I would rest more and not be at my laptop reading, writing, all that sort of stuff. I just laughed. I said, Are you, come on. I, you know, I've, I've found my purpose in life again. I was really energized. But they were right. You know, I, I pushed it too hard. And then, you know, two months out of the – actually, it was less than two months out of the psych ward. I wrote this long piece for Reuters, 3,000-word story. It's called A Special Report. And it had video, it had it had a podcast, a lot of photographs. It got a lot of coverage around the world. And yeah, I just got inundated with messages of, of not just support, but people from all over the world were contacting me and saying, yeah, your, what, your story resonated so much. But what people were also doing was, was really unloading on their own traumatic stories. And I felt like I had to reply to every single message. Mm -hmm. I just felt I had an obligation to do so. And I got hundreds and hundreds of messages. And I, I just, I'm absorbing all this trauma while I'm still, you know, a couple of months out of the psych ward. And I didn't realize, I just had no idea of the impact that was having on me. And yeah, I, I really, uh, I, I started to go down and, and really got close to 
At one stage, Mary said, I think you need to go back to Ward 17 because it was having such an impact on me. I think one of the things I really learned from that experience was trying to find a balance and understanding that while it's great to feel energized again and motivated, you, you just have to pace yourself. Yeah. I thought, not to jump in here with my armchair psychology, but also the fact that, you know, it seems like after you came home from Iraq, you realized that you couldn't be in the field again. And you basically were at working from home editing. Yep. For how long? Uh, so editing stories for a, a few years, but I, I was doing this from home and I, I sort of felt like I'd lost my, my purpose, my meaning, whereas yeah. for the previous 20 years, I'd been in Asia and the Middle East and, and I'd either been you know, a, a younger correspondent reporting a lot of stories, or I'd been a, a bureau chief or a news editor, and I just had a lot of responsibility, and and I I, I loved that, and and mentoring other reporters, running large teams, I got so much satisfaction of that, and then sort of find myself here at home in Tasmania, just editing stories. I think I lost a bit of my identity, and then all the the PTSD trauma started to emerge when I realised that by getting in there and, and trying to work out what was wrong with me and and then telling that story of PTSD, I, I just, it was like the old journalist was back. And so it was, yeah, I'm going to throw the kitchen sink at this, but it wasn't, it wasn't really a, a sensible approach to take. I should have taken it easy. Is there a lesson there? You know, I think a lot of us are, our work identity is so key yeah. to us. <laughs> We've yeah. been told from day one that if we have purpose, Life will be worth living. But I think for you, what your story shows is it's more complicated than that. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, look, I think for a lot of people who are listening, who have a lot of motivation, a lot of drive, and who've done well in their, in their careers, I think that sets people up pretty well to handle trauma or mental illness because you've got tools and skills at your disposal, right? And so what I think a lot of people can do is what was it that got you to where you are in your career today? What got you there? What were those special skills or talents that got you there? Apply that, use that on that diagnosis you've just been given or on that trauma that you're trying to manage and deal with. I used my journalist skills, right? Mm -hmm. Other people use whatever skills they've got. They are transferable. And I think if you turn that towards the trauma or the mental illness, I, I think you're going to find that it's going to really help. But I also think that, like you said, it was draining. It was difficult for you, even as you sort of became a spokesperson and told this incredible story and helped other people see and learn, you know, that that's not without risks. No, that's right. Now, look, what I've learned too as well is just the the importance of saying no. Yeah. And so when I was working at full steam, I could work 16-hour days. It wasn't a problem. But now, because of the insight I have into my own PTSD, I can feel myself starting to just get a little bit out of sync. And, and so I'll just stop. Hmm. And, and I know that I have to take a rest or go for a walk or just do something completely different. And I'm very good at saying no to things. I'll just say to people, I'm sorry, I can't do that because I don't have the mental bandwidth or that's going to just tip me over the edge a bit. So I think for people who are in that process of, of some sort of healing journey or recovery journey, I think being able to say no is probably one of the best tools in the kit bag to have to, to deploy. I want to talk a little bit about what happened at work. You work for Reuters, giant multinational organization. Yeah. It, yeah. I, <laughs> you no longer work there. No. And look, I've worked there half my life. Uh, for me, it was, I, I just got to travel the world as a, as a foreign correspondent, was given a lot of responsibility. And I believed I was very highly regarded and well thought of. But then when I was diagnosed with PTSD, I was treated like damaged goods. Mm. And that was very difficult to deal with. And I'm sure there are people out there listening who will know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Because all of a sudden, I felt like, okay, these guys, they've seen that he's no use to us anymore. 
Yeah. He can't do journalism. He can't report stories. He can't edit stories. And he's a problem. What are we going to do with him? It's not like they can go and sack the person who's covered the Iraq war for them, who's done all this stuff, who staff are being killed on his watch right. But what they can do is they can just let him rot in isolation. And that's what happened to me. It was so distressing and confusing and disorienting. And it really worsened my mental health over a period of time. And then when I got to the psych ward and had my first admission, not long after I got out, they basically, the company tried to uh, force me out. Yeah. Either force me out or force me into the Australian workers' compensation system. And I just want to interject that they did it in a way that everyone listening, you know, with the sort of uh, HR language, mm. passive aggressive yep. email. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. It, it was the deepest betrayal, Mara. And, and as I write in the book, that betrayal for me was harder to get over than anything that happened in my career. It was harder to deal with than the deaths of my staff. It was harder to deal with than the thousands of dead bodies I saw in Aceh after that tsunami. Hmm. Because the betrayal was so, it just cut so deep when you've risked your life for an organization over a number of years, when your family have sacrificed so much. I, I mean, for six years, I hardly saw my kids. I was hmm. traveling so much. When I first got back from my first assignment to Iraq, my youngest son, Harry, didn't even, wasn't really sure who I was. And I think a lot of people can relate to that, right? The sacrifices you make for an organization. And so when they try to subtly force you out or not so subtly force you out, that leaves a big scar. And I could never get to the bottom of who knew what and who knew what when and, and why they wanted to do it. But it really, really cut deep. And with the book... One of the things that has really resonated with a lot of readers, I've got to say, I've had so many people contact me and say, yeah, this happened to me too. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so I think that's been one of the good things of being able to write this book because before I left Reuters in 2020, I said, I'm not signing anything that muzzles me. I'm going to tell my story because I want people to know that this happens a lot. I mean, interestingly, after the company tried to force me out, what happened was I basically refused to speak to Asia where this was happening. But at the same time, it was just a sort of slightly weird situation. This story that I'd written is about to get published by other editors in New York. And then the Asia folks sort of realize, I think, that, oh, my God, this, this story is going to come out. And wow, look at what he's gone through. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of stopped the efforts, I think, to force me out. And then when the story got published and all this positive feedback was coming in, I was sort of untouchable after that. And then I was able to convince head office in New York to create this role of head of mental health and, mm. and well-being for the whole organization. And this was something that had never been done in any media organization before. It was a bit of an experiment. But the people, once this role was set up and I was into it, but the idea was to basically try and create a strategy that would make mental health a priority for Reuters journalists. I had so many journalists coming to me talking about the, just, the, just the, the struggles they were having and how they didn't feel safe talking to HR or their bosses about the issues they were having. And to me, it showed a, there was a culture of fear. Mm. And, and I, I think it speaks to a a sort of a broader climate where organizations are just not doing enough to support staff and to have an environment where mental health is really a priority. You say the most critical factor in trauma recovery is support and your network. Your book is full of first responders from the psych ward whose workplace support actively pushed them out, right? They didn't yep. have the power of the platform that you did. Correct. And it left me thinking, what are institutions for when workers are traumatized? And what is HR for? What would you want them to do? Yeah, look, I, I don't have a lot of faith in institutions or large organizations, Maura. I've got to be honest. Mm. I've got faith in people. I've got faith in individuals. I've got faith in community. I mainly work with small organizations because I think that's where change can happen. 
And I think the change can come from storytelling, right? So the more people tell their story, the more they share their stories. I think that sort of change can come from from bottom up, just the power of the story. But the other thing that can happen, and we're seeing a little bit of this starting in Australia. I'm not sure about the United States, but the, but the laws are getting tougher in Australia around mental health. You guys are so, way ahead, way ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so recently the national legislation has gone into effect that forces companies to put into effect workplace policies that protect the mental health of staff. Now, the implementation of this is going to take years, right? But the laws are at least there. Mm -hmm. And so that's a step forward. Holding organizations to account is going to take a lot longer. But there has to be laws. Otherwise, organizations are not going to do it. HR just reports to the executive suite. HR is not there to look after, I, I don't think in most cases, they don't have the welfare of employees as their top priority. What can employee communities do? Peer support. Peer support's massive. I'm a huge fan of peer support. Uh, You see it in a lot of first responder organizations, and I think it's been very effective. Certainly in Australia, just about every, you know, police, fire, and ambulance all have peer support organizations. And why that works so well is that these are folks who have get a little bit of training, obviously, in how to have conversations right. Mm -hmm. They get trained in how to be a bridge for someone who might need professional help and they are trusted by their colleagues. So a colleague who's struggling is going to probably feel, sometimes will often feel more comfortable having a chat with a colleague as opposed to a HR or a manager. And I think what peer support networks can do is they can put a foundation under an organization, right? They can be a real good protective netting. They're not the be-all and end-all, but I think they're a great fit. And and it doesn't have to be organizations where staff are on the front line. I think any organization can have one and benefit from it because life is stressful for everyone these days. Yes. And you see employee resource, business resource groups, I think, really showing up around mental health and, and, and seeming to have good results. My last question for you, I bet, like me, you get a lot of people reaching out and saying, I have a story. I want to tell yeah. it because I think it can help people. Yeah. But telling that story, especially when it's a tough one and you've been through trauma, is complicated. It's not simple. And it's not always, I think, the best thing for one's own mental health. And I'm just curious what what you tell people when they email you and say, I'm inspired by you and I have a story too, and I think it can help things. Yeah, look, I, I do get asked a fair bit about this. I mean, it took seven years to, to write this book, right? Mm. And that involved a lot of a lot of processing, a lot of thinking. I had a, a huge numbers of journals that I kept, electronic journals, I had to go back and speak to a lot of people, uh, a lot of conversations with my wife, Mary. Mm-hmm. And that whole process was hugely helpful for us as, as a couple and me as an individual. Oh, look, I, I, think, I think it's great that people share their stories in any way they find helpful, whether it's on social media or even just writing to themselves. Maura. <laughs> you, you don't have to share it with the world. The act of writing, how you're feeling can be therapeutic. I mean, the research shows that. I do tend to caution people a bit sometimes because while it's good for people to share their stories, I think it's sometimes you need to be a little bit aware of the consequences mm. of doing so. And and by that, I mean, <laughs> I, I was recently at a podcast with a fellow who was laid off from Google, one of those 10,000 people, right, <laughs> who was laid off at the drop of a hat. And he started talking about that. Some of his friends were saying, hey, are you Okay. And they didn't mean, are you feeling okay mentally? But they were saying, are you mad? You know, mm. you're out there talking about this stuff. You're not going to get another job. And people said that to you too. You sort of wanted to publish stuff and take acts of revenge. You wrote a huge memo to Reuters and yep. your family were like, whoa, slow down. Yeah, yeah. No, my, they never let me send any, send any of that. So I think it needs to be, you need to weigh it up and you need to consider what it is you're, you're going to put out to the world. And it's often better to just wait a few days before you hit send. And what is the message you're trying to get out there? Who you're trying to connect with? 
I don't know if it's the same in the States, but in Australia now, lived experience is the buzzword, right? Yeah. Organizations say, yeah, we're really into lived experience. We really want people who've got that lived experience. Well, I can tell you that I think there's a lot of talk around that and a lot of hot air. But when it comes to people who've been in psych wards like me, I think people are still wary. Yeah. Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. I read an interesting article in New York Magazine and The Body Keeps the Score by Bessie mm. Vandekoek, who you, you talk about in the book, has been on the bestseller list in the U.S. for years at this point. Yep. And the language of trauma is very powerful in the U.S. It is a very, very big piece of personal stories. It's It's big on social media. And there's sort of a growing backlash. There's a worry that when trauma gets to be a piece of everyone's vocabulary, it loses power for mm. uh, I hate to quantify trauma because how can you do that but but not everyone experiences trauma. Trauma is a different thing than hurt than pain yep. than or grief than grief yep and and that's important. So as we become really comfortable with trauma, mm. And we're learning so much about it. That's good. But on the other hand, are we in danger of overusing it? Look, it's a good question. I think it's a great question. And I think it's something we need to talk about. Can you define trauma, actually? Yeah. So trauma is something that happens to someone that leaves, It's a. I would say it's a wound, an emotional wound, a mental wound. And it's long lasting. It's not like the death of an old relative, yeah. right? But the death of a child, uh, a parent who loses a child, that is trauma. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I think is healthy about this debate is that it is broadening people's understanding of what trauma is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Trauma is not just warfare. It's not just natural disasters. It's not just mass shootings. Trauma can take place in all sorts of different situations and scenarios. And I think we are starting to understand, or people are understanding, that bullying is trauma, okay? Someone who goes through a bullying at work over years, that is trauma because mm -hmm. of the personal nature of the attack and the impact it can have on an individual. That can be lifelong mm -hmm. for someone. So when we look at what is trauma, then I think we need to look at, well, are we talking about something that, that requires a diagnosis, i.e. post-traumatic stress disorder? Are we talking about something that is something that is, is you know, really causing impairment to that individual? Or is it something that is maybe just a, a sort of a part of their life, but it's in the background? And what I don't like is mm -hmm. when people sort of start to play down the impact of trauma, mm -hmm. because trauma is real. And it's, it's real for a hell of a lot of people. And I think we have to respect when people say they feel traumatized. And this is one of the things that Bessel van der Kolk says, and I think it's a really good point. His view is you don't try and tell someone how they should feel. You listen to them and whatever their story is, you go from there. And I think that's got to be the starting point for any clinician is to listen and understand and hear that person's story and then go from there. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, no, great to talk to you, Mara. It's, uh, I, I think that, that, look, there's so much that uh, I think organizations can be doing around mental health and trauma, but they're not. And I think it's partly because they think this stuff's going to be too expensive or it's going to be too hard, it's going to be too complicated, but it's not really. It's, it's all about leadership and having the will to do it. It's as simple as that. And it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it is uncomfortable, right? But if, if, people, if organizational leaders actually put their mind to it and actually sit down and, and, and say, we're going to get our heads around this, that, it, it's just, it just makes such a difference to an organization's culture and the morale and the bottom line takes care of itself after that. That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. 
If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn, where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the anxious achiever world. Thanks for listening.